Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel, our once a month once a month channel. channel. If you're new here, I'm Allison. I'm Leanne. And we are sharing LGBTQ, not really Q, yeah, but I guess Q content on our channel. Once a month, we typically do vlogs and Disney content. I mainly do it. But um, we've had requests for sharing our family story. So today, we are going to be sharing our infertility story. We'd love for you to stick around. Please feel free to hit that subscribe button and give us a video thumbs up if you enjoy the content. And... I don't know, what else should they do? Comment below with what you'd like to see next from us. But anyway, let's hop into our infertility story. Okay, so early on in my infertility story, I had a friend who um, recommended that I did some journaling. And I'm so happy I did because in this journal, it has all the numbers and tests and everything that we did every single month for, I don't know, the year and how long was it? year and two months I think it took for me to get pregnant and it had every up and down and it had other people's stories in it and I think it's just a really great keepsake and I initially started writing to Ruthie who if you don't watch the channel is our oldest daughter and um, just writing my feelings to her and it felt so cathartic so I recommend initially just off the bat if you are someone who is struggling with I don't like calling it infertility I never did I say struggling with fertility um, I just infertility just feels so definite definitive I, yeah it feels like very depressing yeah, yeah. I, I for someone who's struggling with their fertility I highly recommend grabbing a journal and writing to your future child and it really helps you keep focus on the goal which is you know expanding your family i did it on the computer oh you did yeah i just wrote like i mean i saved everything in the computer my gmail drafts folder has like probably three thousand drafts in it but like that's what i would do because yeah. i wasn't gonna like find a journal and yeah. try to keep hold of it but i feel like i'm always at my computer so when the moment struck i would just like write what right. i was feeling so i think just starting off like it says fertility pregnancy journal january 2014 2015 and then it had ruthie's due date and then her birthday and everything and this actually so this right here it Look says yeah it says there are so many beautiful reasons to be happy so i asked my sister-in-law i went she to does, her house she my sister does this great thing that i love about her where she kind of puts these like um really uplifting messages in like nice scrapbooking paper or whatever all over the house. Well, I had seen that she did it when she was trying to get pregnant with oh. her second child. Um, she also had her own fertility story and um, she had put these like really nice uplifting messages all around her house and I was like, I, I need that, could, could you do that for me? And so this is just, I, I kept just one and I put it in because it felt weird to take it off. It was so important during that year. And so um, I kept it and it just said, there are so many beautiful reasons to be happy. And I think it just kept me focused and positive during the entire experience. So February, so it started February 2014 was our first try. And that was an at-home try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's funny because I don't even know that they send like donor samples anymore. Like, I don't think they even do send mean? them. Like I don't think they send it. I think everything has to be done through a doctor now. Like, oh really? No, I don't even think you can get this <laughs> Yeah, patient. back then. So you can choose like, back then you could choose whether you wanted it sent to the house or to the doctor's office. So you could just like send it to the house. And since it's a frozen donor sample, it it comes in dry ice <laughs> dry but in order to like handle dry ice like it's a it, it was like a glove. it was a big metal like 30 pound dry ice container For a sample that's this literally big. this big. literally that big it's so tiny. you have to get gloves yeah. and we were living at your parents house at this yeah. point so like we're like rummaging through the garage for like <laughs> gardening gloves so we finally oh we used like snow snow yeah. gloves so you open it up and it was like dry ice. It was like, <laughs> and then in order to get the donor sample up to room temperature, you can't 
like put it in the microwave or anything so you have to walk you around kill it. You, you have to walk around like either holding you it in it your like hand your or put it under your armpit <laughs> so for like 30 minutes i remember just like walking around doing normal stuff like holding this yeah. tiny little vial um i think that that was a good i you know like doing it at home is whatever but i mean it works for a lot of people in the first yeah, it try, does. and i have friends who it has worked got pregnant for. on the yeah. first try we only did two tries at home because truthfully so this was February was our first try, but in January I got some blood tests done and they had seen that I had low progesterone. Now, I hadn't had any ultrasounds done at that point. Um, basically, when you have low progesterone, when you ovulate, you want to have over 10 when you get this blood test done for your progesterone. Well, mine was 7.5, so it wasn't like terrible. I was still ovulating, but it just wasn't a very strong surge. So they knew that I needed some help and of course they were like it could be an off month blah 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 and i was like well could we try at home and my doctor was like absolutely you come back to me when you're ready so we tried in february and march at home obviously neither of them work so then we moved on to the doctor's office to start with iui and the first thing i started with so they do like an ultrasound and they realized that i had polycystic ovarian syndrome which means that i have polycystic ovaries and Basically, I have tons of little eggs that never formulate into one large egg, essentially, that typically makes, can turn into, it can an, turn into an embryo. So I just had a bunch of little ones. And um, so the first month I started with Fumara. Fumara worked beautifully for me. I can tell you exactly. I had one mature follicle that month in April. And we did the Avadrel shot just to ensure that I ovulated yeah I remember ovidrol is to make sure i ovulated and then we did my iui my progesterone was great at 27.5 and then um i still got my period so obviously we were really sad because it was a good month like we had a lot of strong yeah so that we moved into we did may right we moved into may so at this point that's our fourth month trying because we are still on the same donor no we had a different donor so we tried different donors should we switch between these two well once you once we started doing IUI the donor sample gets shipped to the hospital yeah and they what do they do wash it yeah they do like they have to wash it because so what an IUI is is they basically put the donor sample past your cervix. Your cervix, so that um, it has a better chance of meeting the egg mm -hmm. in the fallopian tubes. But in order to go past the cervix, it has to be like clean and yeah. whatever. And yeah. Like get rid of all the bad bad, yeah. bad. yeah. Yeah. So they have to like wash it. So we. So they get, but they can tell you, um, can't they tell you like the count? Yeah, and fertility the, and everything. Yeah. And I have all the counts and everything in here. Mm -hmm. um, so in May, which was the next month, we found out that my sister-in-law and brother were pregnant. Oh yeah. And that was really tough. Not because, um, it wasn't because I didn't want them to be pregnant. I was sad because I felt like they were hiding it from me. And like, I know that they weren't, but like there was a part of me that felt like they didn't want to tell me because they didn't want me to feel badly about my own because that was their first time. They were, I mean, yeah, you can be honest. We love them, but it was one of those situations where they were like, uh, we're thinking about it, and then yeah. boom, they were pregnant. Yeah, I mean, it was really just like one. Yeah, it was one like, time. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so um, on this one, we still, we did another round of Famara, and um, saw that there was possibly two mature follicles. By the time I did my Avadrol shot, I did my IUI, my lining was like perfect. This was like an amazing month because like the count was 79 million, which is like, you want above 10 million and it was like 79 million. We couldn't, we couldn't believe like the numbers and everything. 79 million what? Sperm count. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I know. I know the count was wow. amazing. My lining was incredible. Everything yeah. was like perfect and I still ended up with my period. Not pregnant. What month was that? 
May month four or five four June month five two mature follicles so this one had 106 million 50% motility and yep two mature follicles 20 and 24 they were such a good size in June and still got my period um so at that point we had spent just over six thousand dollars oh you put the tally in mm -hmm. yeah i kept it all because i wanted to be able to do something like this one day i never thought i would have a youtube channel but <laughs> i wanted to do some i wanted to share the story at some point you know so anyway um i did a son hysterogram and um they found that my tubes were clear and everything looked great and there was no reason that I shouldn't be pregnant. So after that, um, we did one, we started with injectables. So I did a round of Famara yeah. and Gonal F and then um, the dominant follicle was on my right side, which was really interesting because I had a stage four endometrioma on there, which is like a big, it's endometriosis. So it's like a big, I don't know, something. It's endometriosis on my ovary. And so I had, so at this point guys, I had polycystic ovarian syndrome and endometriosis. And I just like, <laughs> like luckily the endometriosis was only on that right ovary, but my dominant follicle was on my right ovary, which was really interesting. Um, because typically I only ovulated from my left side and not that it mattered um, because I didn't get pregnant that month either <laughs> we decided to take a break we came out to California because you were working out in California mm -hmm. and we took um, two months off and I think a lot of people with any sort of fertility struggles find that they will take a break at some point yeah I think it was really, I mean, that was six months it was of really trying. emotionally taxing on you, especially. It was physically taxing. Yeah. Because I was, I was. Yeah, well, you're pumping your body full of stuff, and there's like, you open the fridge, and there's like all these needles and mm -hmm. shots, and you had to set timers, and it's like, a we've lot. set a lot of timers in our life for shots, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the, I didn't have to go through a lot of that kind of stuff like all the stuff that was going on in your body obviously but just that time period where like the two week wait it was always the two week wait yeah. that was like remember and you would take tests before you were supposed to or whatever so it was like you were just constantly and that's how you are about things which mm -hmm. is fine but it was just like constant yeah you tend to be very Generally, I think you're a very optimistic person, but for whatever reason with this I was it, not. Yeah, you weren't. you weren't I just it all felt like a giant waste of time when I knew that my best shot was IVF because People with PCOS Know this that our best shot is IVF because of the way that we produce follicles and just like the way that embryos are created, it's really hard to do when you have polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's just, IVF for great candidates for IVF mm -hmm. because of it. And I knew this, this was in the back of my mind the whole time. This was the month where the doctor left. Ooh. I just like, this was I a actually, rough, this, was a this, this is infuriates a, a down. Me. This infuriates me. She was. This was a low point. This doctor, I actually took her off my case after this. I called and said she could not treat me anymore because she was so. Look, you guys, I really respect the medical profession. My dad is an OB/GYN. My mom is a trained nurse. My parents met in an ER, and like. I have a ton of respect and I rarely complain very rarely because to me doctors are human this was the worst doctor I've ever been treated by in my entire life and I took her off my case I complained about her and she ended up getting fired did you know that mm -hmm. she ended up getting fired not because well, she of had no bedside manner none she was terrible 
So I had three mature follicles this month. And anytime you have more than one mature follicle, if you have two or more, they will give you a multiples talk. And I had already had it at this point. Multiples meaning multi the, a chance of having a multiple. A chance of having more than one child. Yeah. And they will give you the multiples talk of like what what happened if you have two, if you have three, if you have four what, uh, implanted. I'm, not that I would, I would, they never did more than. So this month I had three mature follicles. But at this point I had I had never been pregnant. I had never gotten pregnant. So anytime I had two mature, I had, this was number five. And I had had three multiples in my mm -hmm. four IUIs that I had had. So and you'd had the talk before. Exactly. So I had had the talk before, but it was more like, you have three mature follicles. They're not really, all three of them aren't going to stick. Mm -hmm. So like, because just because of what had happened prior, I just wasn't at risk for having more than two. So anyway, she just was like, so I had already had the multiples talk and she called me i was supposed to have my iui at 10 30 that morning she called me at 9 30 when i'm at work and i call her back i don't know 15 minutes later and she goes hi allison and i was like yeah is everything okay she's like yes yes but i just need to have the multiples talk with you i said well i've already had the multiples talk and she goes yes but you have three mature follicles so i needed to send this for the i needed to send this donor sample back in and i was like what do you mean and literally on the paperwork from the embryologist it said that donor sample had sat out for five minutes and thawing and then they refroze it and I was furious because you have to understand these are expensive. Like when you purchase them and then when every time they clean it, every time you get an IUI, just like the entire process is very expensive and our everything was terrible. The motility was 30%. We had never had anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the count was 23 million. I mean, it was awful. And you guys know, I had, I don't know if you guys heard, but it was 79 million, 109 million, 50% motility every time. We had never had it this bad. And I was, I was Livid. so angry. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like her bedside manner was terrible, but she, I mean, like I hate calling her dumb, but she was an idiot. No, but what anyway, she was like so dumb. <laughs> so... I, needless to say, I didn't get pregnant that month, and no kidding, I didn't have a chance. So that was the month that our doctor started talking to us about IVF, and we were like, "All right." And we had just found out that your insurance was gonna pay what eighty percent of the cost of IVF. I think they were gonna pay eighty percent of the cost of IVF if you had like a diagnosis diagnosable medical problem and you had done at least six, six IUIs. At that point we had done five. So we found out we had to do like another Hail Mary basically. So we did another IVF in November. It didn't work. Or an IUI. IUI. I mean we did another IUI in November. I did metformin. They started putting me a metformin. I forgot about that. Which is like for insulin resistance i'm not insulin resistant but just in case it wasn't going to hurt anything so they figured it's a protocol for people with pcos and they switched us to brevel and i stimmed for 12 days which is the longest i've ever stimmed for and I ended up with one mature follicle my lining was great so then we took what three months off we did IVF in February. Mm -hmm. So we took. I was doing musical. Oh yeah. I was doing singing in the rain. Yeah. So I. Had, Allie's like. I had basically put my life immensely on immensely talented. And we were living in Ann Arbor when while I was in law school, and so you decided to like go back to your roots and do a, <laughs> do a musical theater. I decided to do a musical you had because a lot I was of really unhappy. Well, yeah. I was unhappy yeah, at the time. True. And I was like, Leanne was like, stop putting your life on hold for this baby. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't do anything but try and it have It kind a baby. of overtakes your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
anybody's life, you know, that's understandable. Yeah. But you needed something like fun to get your mind off of it. And I think you had fun. I had a great time. Yeah. I met one of my best friends, Caroline. Oh, yeah. I mean, I knew her before, but like we became very close during that show. Um, yeah, so we did IVF in February. So we did IVF did in it. February yeah. because I got that lead mm -hmm. and I got, I was, I played Kathy Selden in Singing in the Rain. All right, so anyway, we started in February. I went in for my initial look on my ovaries on February 2nd. Everything looked great, lots of little follicles, and my lining was under four. My estradiol was 38, and they wanna see it under 60, I believe. Um, and they wanna see your lining under five or six. I don't know, everything looked great to start the cycle. So I started 150 IUIs of Gravel, blood draw, estradiol was 88, more Gravel, and started Minifer, which stung. I think it was Minifer that like really stung. After that, I would ice beforehand. So then I needed another blood draw, and it was 258, which was good, because we wanted it rising. So then I started Ganarelix, remember that? So I was doing Gravel, Manipure and Ganarelix. I feel like now that you mentioned it, our life over the past like five years has just been like a constant stream <laughs> of like injections. So then I did another blood draw on uh, ultrasound. My estradiol was 653. I was really worried about overstimming. So this is unique to, I know I keep saying this is unique to PCOS people, but it's true. This is unique to, I mean, that it isn't unique to Anybody, but we have a higher instance of hyperstimulation, which means it just can make you really, really sick. And um, so I was really worried about my estradiol getting too high. So anyway, my estradiol this time was 653. Lining was nine. We were in good shape, blood, dr blood draw. And then I had my one mature follicle, which was 18.3. Um, and to almost mature at 16. So once you get to one mature follicle, they trigger you. Oh wait, no, they want at least two, I think. So my lining was 14, I had three mature follicles at 18, lots of smaller ones measuring between 10 and 17. My estradiol was 1687. When they counted, they found 14. They thought they were gonna get 14 follicles. <laughs> Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. They thought they were gonna get 14 follicles. So I did my trigger shot, which was 10,000 HCG units. I did not do Avadrel because I was at high risk for overstimulation, mm -hmm. hyperstimulation. So you do just like plain straight up HCG. So we woke up super early because we had a, what, 7.30 retrieval. I think. All those appointments were always super early. Well, because we always wanted to do them before you went to school. So they, so like I said, they thought they were going to get 14 follicles. And how many did we get? 30. 30 eggs. 30 eggs. And how many, do you remember how many were mature? 17. 25. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I had 25 mature ones and 17 fertilized normally. So we did get to do a five day transfer. I have like all the pictures and everything from like the five day. Oh look, it's my schedule. So this is all everything I had to take and do. And I would just cross off every day. And I kept it all, I was very organized. <laughs> Cause I had nothing better to do than keep my meds organized. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we needed to be, we had those things, those calendars plastered like all over the house. So Ruthie was the best looking blastocyst. She was a 4AA. She was a perfect blastocyst. So they have like gradings of everything mm -hmm. and the best you can get is a 4AA, which means perfect outside, perfect inside. And it's to the full like maturity that they wanted. The size and all yeah. that stuff, yeah. And so that's our Ruthie. Perfect little blessed. <laughs> she's a cool little human. Oh yeah, she's the best. You're, you're gonna tell them about the transfer? It was cool because they give you like a Xanax. Yeah. 
So you take a Xanax so to relax their, your uterus. Yeah, when they do the retrieval, you go under. Yeah. So you don't remember. Well, you I mean, do it like a twilight. It's yeah, not like it fully anesthesia. It doesn't take very long, but but when they put it back in, you're just taking Xanax. So you're yeah. super loopy. Yeah. And so the reason why is because they want your uterus completely relaxed for the procedure because they want to be able to place the embryo in a, the mm -hmm. best spot for it. And it. But it was cool because I got to be in there and the doctor just, like there's a monitor and then he's got a little thing with the... Yeah, and he's like, he shows you. He's like, so he points with his finger and you can see it and then they just like, boop, drop it, and, drop it and then take out the tool that they use yeah. and then... It's like a tiny little then, tube. Yeah. But it's and cool. then they we go back, they take it back to the embryologist who checks it to make sure that the embryo's out. Uh -huh. and but we have that on video too. It's cool. Because it's like, boom, you know the minute that you're pregnant, all you have to do is just stay pregnant. Mm -hmm. So it's all very exact and precise. Uh -huh. Anyway, so the next day I got this like crazy rash. And if you know anything about me at the time, I, oh my goodness, I was allergic to everything and I was like freaking out because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm allergic to my own baby. <laughs> I didn't know I was pregnant yet though, but I was like, this is any, if this is indicative of whether or not I'm pregnant. Well, you were pregnant. I was. But, I mean like, she no. She had implanted, impl yeah. they, the it was the embryo implant. implants within the first 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So the implantation rash. Did you have one with Rosie? Mm -mm. No. Nope, it was completely normal. I knew I was pregnant with Rosie though. With Ruthie, I didn't know if I was pregnant or not. With Rosie, I knew right away. I could, I no. looked at you. I could feel it. I could feel her, like, A of all, I could feel her implanting because it feels like cramping. And then um, I could feel Rosie implant, and then I felt really bloated. And like that's immediately? Immediately, yeah. So wild. Yeah, so like, I mean, a lot of women will tell you once they do get pregnant, they're like, you feel once very you've bloated. Been pregnant. It's just because the embryo, I mean, there's nothing that's ever been in your uterus ever. So, like, <laughs> once something's in your uterus and it's growing at, you know, 10,000 times, it's multiplying at 10,000 times or whatever it is, you know, it's growing at this very rapid pace. Pregnant. I've heard people say that before, though, that once you've been pregnant, that when you do get pregnant again, you just like know. Yeah. Like that is. Here's my first pregnancy test. It was at 10 days. So when I took it, I looked at it and I thought it was negative and I threw it away. Because I was like, whatever. I can't believe I'm not pregnant. Like it was 10 days. Yes. 10 DPO. So it was, when did we, we did the transfer on a Tuesday and I knew by Friday that I was pregnant with. Anyway, so I took it at like 6 a.m. because everybody wakes up. You can look at any video on the internet and they wake up at like 6 a.m. <laughs> and they're like, I'm not pregnant. Well, I looked at it, I was like, I'm not pregnant and I threw it in the trash. But here's the thing. You always then pick it back up out of the trash and you look at it again. And I looked at it again and I was like, oh my God, there's a line. And I had never, okay, you guys, never in the what year and two months or whatever we had been trying to get pregnant had I ever seen a line ever so I knew that I was pregnant even though it was past the time allotted or whatever there never lines just don't show up and it wasn't an evaporation line I have, still have the test it's right here um I don't even know if you can see it on camera it's the second one. Oh yeah you can see it yeah I don't know if you guys can see it. if you can see the second one the pregnancy line is like right there. I think you guys can see it. I don't know. Anyway, that's like the, this is the control on this side and then that's the line getting darker. But Yeah, so it was two at home, six IUIs. Six IUIs and at that point, since I had really amazing health insurance, uh, they, it covered that's IVF smart. since we for for um, heterosexual couples what is it how long do you have to try before the, the they year? have to do six IUIs too. oh okay so six but, IUIs no matter who you are but then yeah and then IVF and how many donors was it that we went through I think we tried with four different donors until we ended up with this donor what do you remember most about that before the, before moving to IVF what do you remember most about that year 
it was emotionally and physically exhausting. It was one of the hardest years. 2014 was one of the hardest years of my life. Yeah. It was just like, you just feel really devastated a lot. And that's a hard feeling to have constantly. You know, like feeling devastation, right? You feel devastation throughout your life, but to feel that for a full year. And I think the uncertainty of whether or not I was gonna get pregnant, I think was the scariest of all. Yeah. Because I couldn't get pregnant at that point. I just remember it was like, you know, obviously I wasn't the one going through it, but I remember feeling like as a partner, there's like nothing you could do. Yeah. You know, and like sometimes it, it was just really difficult to kind of gauge like yeah. whether you were, and for the most part, you're like a very rational person and it was just one of those things where it's like, you never know if you're going to be in a uplifting mood about it or you're going to be devastated about it. And it's like, it's one of those things where you don't, we don't, I, you know, I didn't know if we were ever going to get pregnant. Yeah. You didn't know if we were ever going to get pregnant. So it's not like you can say, you know, everything's going to work out in the end. It was really tough. I wouldn't wish it on anybody because it's just so, you just feel inadequate and, and you're not, and you're not. That's the thing is like, these are things that are beyond your control. You're not inadequate. You're not a failure. You're not, you're none of those things. And I just, I don't know. Infertility is incredibly isolating. Fertility. Struggling with fertility mm -hmm. is incredibly isolating. I mean, I look at people in our community, our Disney community, and like, I know that a lot of you guys are suffering from fertility issues. And like, I mean, look at the trackers. I know you don't know who they are, but Jen and Tim Tracker are two of like the biggest Disney YouTubers. Please tell me about them. And they, I literally sobbed, I'll link that video, but I literally sobbed through their pregnancy video because I know that they've been dealing with infertility since they've been married. And like seven years later, they find out they're having this like little miracle baby. It's really amazing. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up. Consider subscribing, and we will see you in the next one. Bye.